told me if he roller skated fast enough, his loneliness couldn't catch up to him. The best reason I ever heard for trying to be a champion. What I wonder tonight, pedaling hard down King William Street, is if it translates to bicycles. A victory. To leave your loneliness kind of panting behind you as you float free into a cloud of sudden azaleas. Pink petals that have never felt loneliness, no matter how slowly they fall. That was the right by Naomi Shiatnai. Words matter, especially when talking about something like poetry. Words do matter because they may affect somebody differently than they affect you. Now, when we don't think about the effect of how we use our words in our daily lives, the results can be worse than you may think. Someone might not consider the significance of an offhand sexist joke or a compliment on the street, when the person on the receiving end can be made to feel extremely uncomfortable. Now, no matter your background, whether you spend more time in an educational setting or a workplace, you probably witnessed or experienced sexual harassment, maybe without even realizing it can be classified as that. So, when I decided that this was important for me to talk about because I started seeing this more in my life, I had to ask myself a couple of questions. What negative effects do these behaviors have on people? Why do we normalize these behaviors? And more importantly, how do we combat them? Because although we may have conversations about why sexual violence is not okay, and maybe how it should change, how do we push these ideas of progress into our daily lives? So, starting with what harassment is and where we see it, I began researching different types of sexual harassment. But not to bore you with definitions, I just started picturing an average high school party. Ten or so teenagers hanging out, seemingly having a good time. Maybe there's snacks, some drinks, a pool, a hot tub, whatever it may be. Seem to be having a good time. And maybe one of the friends sees someone walking by in a bathing suit and makes a comment about their body. Or maybe there's some pressure for a friend that doesn't really like wearing a bathing suit in public to get in the pool. I know I've seen this kind of thing in my life all the time. The whole Come on, get in the pool, it'll be fun. What are you, scared? But this is actually classified as gender harassment, which is the most common form of sexual harassment. This is designed to make a person on the receiving end feel pressured into accepting this coercion through repeated, unwanted conversation like that. And although this seems harmless, ineffective, it can lead to such harsher things, such as sexual bribery, which is when someone promises you something in return for sexual favors, such as money, or hey, I'll do something for you in the future. This could lead to something even worse. Maybe the perpetrator decides that you have no other choice because they'll leak some nude photos of you or spread lies to your friends. Now this is only possible if we allow people to believe that gender harassment is okay because then it will prosper into something that is worse, such as sexual assault or even rape. So when we do talk about this, we have to talk about the effects that it has on a victim, because it is not easy to come forward about sexual assault, despite what many people may think. Someone could be misinformed about what sexual harassment is, and if they even have a right to be upset about what happened to them. A lot of victims know their abusers, so there may be pressure not to come forward about someone that has hurt them because they might be close to them. They may feel powerless, as if they can't remove the damage that has been done to their body. Isolation, as if their friends wouldn't care anyway, so why even try to talk about it? This leads to decline in self esteem and possible negative health effects down the road in terms of mental stability and even sometimes physiological effects. But all in all, it is hard to stand up and say that someone has hurt you when something like this eats away at your brain. So when we see this kind of thing happen to victims, why do we normalize harmless behavior? Recently, especially, 
young men and women alike have come forward as victims of sexual violence. We can see in the Harvey Weinstein case from just a couple of months ago that a very popular and powerful movie producer was accused of asking women or pressuring women into sexual favors. Many women because of that power structure. Now when we talk about this, usually the questions aren't immediately asked about the accused, they're asked about the accuser. What were you wearing? Was your clothing tight? Were you drinking? Were you asking for it? Now when these types of questions are asked, it's as if there's a way to excuse this violence happening to somebody. As if, if she's wearing tight clothing, she deserves to be raped. Clothing is not, and never will be, consent. And although that should be known by everyone, it isn't. Because it still wouldn't be their fault. A rape trial took place in Ireland on November 6, 2018, just a couple of months ago. A 27-year-old defendant was found not guilty of raping a 17-year-old girl. During the trial, the young girl's underwear, only 17, was held up to prove that she was asking for it because she wore a provocative lingerie that night. The defendant was found not guilty. The defendant's lawyer insisted, you have to look at the way she was dressed. But those are her private clothing. And if she wanted that to happen, it would not be considered rape. Victims see cases like this, and they don't speak up due to fear of similar mistreatment in court systems. When we have such harsh cases like this to look at and see a young woman's underwear held up in front of a jury, it is no wonder that a majority of cases go unreported. Out of every thousand rapes, 230 are reported to police. That's around three out of four. Out of those 230, 46 lead to arrest. Nine of those 46 are referred to prosecutors. Five will lead to a felony conviction and 4.6 will lead to actual jail time. Out of a thousand rapes, less than five, less than five of those rapists end up in prison. But I'm not worried about those five, I'm worried about the 995 that walk away from this crime with no responsibility taken for their actions believing that this kind of crime is okay, that this kind of crime is okay because nobody cares about this kind of crime. We don't talk about this one because if we encourage victims not to come forward, if we say to victims, we don't believe you, then they won't speak up. When behavior like this happens every day, it becomes unavoidable. 321,500 Americans above the age of 12 will be victims of sexual abuse this year. Around 62,000 children will become victims of sexual abuse this year. And out of one out of every six American women will become victims of attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. And one out of 33 American men will become victims of attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. I have five sisters. If one in every six American women will become victims of attempted or completed rape in their lifetime, it's difficult to look around the table and think, which of the six of us will it be? It's bound to be one of us. But not if we confront this type of violence. When you see this happen in your life, when you see this type of verbal, coercive harassment in your life, what do you do? Laugh it off? When someone compliments you on the street, you usually just walk away, because that's the safer thing to do. Confronting people is not easy. In fact, it's one of the hardest things you can do, is confront someone when you feel like you're in a dangerous situation. 
And if you are in danger, maybe that isn't the best idea. But if you have the ability to, Martha Langevin, an author of a book about how to confront abusers and harassers head on during the situation, she encourages you to do the unexpected. Name the behavior. Whatever the harasser has just done, say it and be specific. Stick to your own agenda, don't respond to diversionary tactics. Objecting to harassment is a matter of principle. Make it clear, be straightforward and blunt, be clear that everybody has the right to be free from sexual harassment and assault. Reinforce your statements with strong, self-respecting body language. Head up, shoulders back, eye contact. Don't smile. This might seem unorthodox, but confronting this type of common sexual harassment, the small things like gender harassment. Come on, get in the pool, it'll be fun. If you confront this type of person and say, hey, this makes people uncomfortable. This is not an okay thing to do to people. Putting people in this situation is unfair. People don't deserve this type of harassment. Then we can confront this type of abuse. And it will stop. But not if nobody does anything about it. When it is normalized, when we tell victims we don't believe you, when we create a society of victim blame and distrust, when we foster harassment, we raise assaults. To refer to my initial statement, words do matter. When they have such a damaging, devastating effect on human beings, take time to use them wisely and ensure that your friends do too. Thank you.